Um, dear President Deri, dear colleagues, friends, and ladies and gentlemen, I thought it would be appropriate to use this title because I am a physicist uh, by training, um, professor of systems neuroscience at Aalto University, and uh, associate professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School. So I have kind of background on all of these three aspects, basic neuroscience, technical innovations, and <coughs> clinical applications of brain imaging. And I am, after an introduction, going to discuss these three aspects in, in the, what I call in the MEG case. MEG is a method which measures magnetic fields from the brain, and it's one of the functional brain imaging methods in use right now, and I will talk about the very meager beginnings in Boston, then about multi-channel system development here, and how this development uh, inspired basic research and clinical applications um, in this uh, university and elsewhere, and what has um, happened also recently in Boston, and, and, uh, and then try to do the impossible, to, that is to tell a little bit about the future, and then conclude. So we tend to think, especially from the point of view of Aalto University, which used to be the Helsinki University of Technology, that there's some kind of an idea that technical innovations are made by engineers and then they are distributed on one hand to neuroscientists which use them, and on the other hand to the clinics where they can be used to treat patients. And maybe there's a link between the basic neuroscience and clinical applications, but that's not always so strong. And from this uh, division of work, of work idea, you come to the kind of conclusion that these technical innovations could be done, done somewhere like Aalto University or MIT, the neuroscience at um, University of Helsinki or Harvard University, and, and, and then the clinical applications in the hospital. And uh, but I know very well from Boston is that this goes all wrong. So, so the mo many of the imaging technical innovations are done in the hospital, MGH. And then actually MIT does a lot of basic neuroscience. And the clinical applications are developed, in fact, in all of these institutions. So you cannot dictate people from beforehand by how this kinds of structures built up, they just emerge with history. And um, it's very useful to have um, um, many aspects of this in the same place because uh, some law of communication says that both information and gossip travel at the speed of light, but information tends to travel only 10 meters. So it's much better to have, um, have your colleagues on these different aspects close by rather than five kilometers away. And therefore, therefore we come to the idea that these three different aspects cross fertilize each other and we should actually, I think, talk about more of collaboration rather than division of work. So let's look at what happened in brain imaging. Here are many brain imaging methods that depicted at the center is the anatomical MRI, which uh, takes very precise pictures of the brain structures and also of the anatomical wiring of the brain. Up here we have functional MRI, which tells about brain activity at the low time, slow time scale, and up here we have MEG and EEG, measurement of the magnetic and electric fields from the brain, which can precisely tell the timing of the activity and especially MEG in a bit of reasonable 5 to 10 millimeter accuracy also where the act activity occurs. And I am going to tell you a little bit about the development of MEG and how these different aspects were involved in it. Research, innovation and clinical applications. This is the first recorded magnetoencephalogram. You can see the date is May 13, 1971. So about um, four, 44 years ago. And this was measured by David Cohen at MIT. And why it was measured in 1971 and not earlier is also shown here. 
the strength of this 10 hertz alpha oscillation in the back of the head is only 10 to minus 8 Gauss, which means that uh, it's about 100, 1 to 100 million of the Earth's magnetic field, which is about 1 Gauss. And to measure such a field, you need the shield against the external magnetic disturbances, and you need a special instrument which is based on a superconducting device called the squid. There's one squid in my mm, uh, type in here. Right here is a small, mm, small integrated circuit element nowadays. And here we have David Cohen in the middle, Jim Zimmerman, the inventor of this device on the right, and Ed Elsack, who was at the Office of Naval Research on the left. And here is David now. He's my office mate in Boston. Boston, he's now 87 years old and still going strong. There are no rules against him working, working there. So, in a nutshell, MEC measures signals from the brain, electric currents, which are, for example, evoked by an electric stimulus to the wrist. And then, the, if the right wrist is uh, stimulated, then the left somatosensory cortex is activated. And Unfortunately, this activity is hidden by the skull and the scalp. And therefore, we can measure it only with special means. And one of the means is to measure the magnetic field with an, with an array of detectors. So to map the magnetic field as shown here. And then from this map, we try to find out where in the brain the actual activity was. And this is the basic premise of MEG. However, in the 80s, we had only a single channel at a time. So to map the field like this on the head, we needed four, maybe 45 measurements times 200 repetitions of the same stimulus. So the uh, subjects in this case um, received about 10,000 electric shocks to the wrist to map the field. <laughs> so, so therefore, therefore, um, better means per need. And also, it was hard to know where the activity exactly in the brain was and when it happened. And then there was this guy who was very much against conventional wisdom, Olli Lohnesman. Because people claimed very seriously that it's impossible to operate 100 or even 10 of these quiz sensors together because they interfere with each other. And Olli said basically that this is this is nonsense. We need, need the whole head MEG instrument to be, be able to do this map at once. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be built. So stop complaining. This was basically what he said. Another idea he had was that it's absolutely necessary to have a multidisciplinary team in the, in the laboratory. So very early on, he hired Rita Hari, who is, who is here on the right with Olli, Olli full time in the lab, lab. And as Rita said the other day, it has done her no harm to be working in the low temperature laboratory. So names don't matter so much. Um, and indeed, these technological innovations and also clinical applications were accelerated by this immediate presence of many disciplines in them in the lab. Now, uh, uh, another aspect is the analysis methods. Uh, I don't know better Risto Ilmoniemi is in the audience. Yes, he is. So the, here he is uh, in 1984 in New York. And when I entered the lab in 1981, he was just finishing his master's thesis and, 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 and then I applied to be a st summer student, and everybody wanted to go to the starting brain group at that time, but that wasn't possible. And when we drew straws with um, uh, Berti Hakonen, Professor Berti Hakonen as a judge, and then as a result, Jukka Knudla and myself went, went to the brain group so much about career planning, and this, is, this has continued to this day. So this I have told to students when they are worried about what should I do. So, so this is not, not so maybe crucial, but really, really follow your instinct. And, and here I am uh, in the 80s in Moscow in, in a meeting. So 
so our challenge with Risto was to find on the basis of MEC where and when things are happening in the brain. And this is called the inverse problem and actually we did pretty well because, because our methods were used in the neuro commercial Neuromax software which was developed in this university. And also and in Boston I have developed a software package which has the now the called m &E, which is now the rather new idea that is not centrally developed but the development is spread out throughout the world. And this is another example of collaboration. This is totally spontaneous collaboration between these young, young people which I haven't been able to prevent, I would say. <laughs> so I, I, I have enjoyed seeing this, this very much. So over the years we developed several MEG instruments starting from a four channel instrument up to a 306 channel instrument which is operational now. And at some point the company was formed and that company has marketed these instruments worldwide as shown in this, in this list here in, in North America, in Europe, in the Far East. So, so this, this idea of only really has become to fruit, has been a fruitful idea and has resulted in this, this worldwide distribution of the devices. So of course we saw immediately when the whole head instrument was available that we can more conveniently do the same as before. But we found many things which we didn't know before. We couldn't expect that, um, that we could get su such a wealth of new data. So I, have, I always say that at that time every measurement was a paper. And this is one of the papers, the Nature paper, about dynamics of brain activation in picture naming. So these kinds of things could have been done previously a little bit with fMRI, but this was the first time when you could follow the activity from the back of the head, from the visual cortices, all the way to the motor cortices where the, where the actual speech is produced. So, and compare situations where you don't actually speak versus just think about the word versus when you speak. And, and this was very nice that we could map, map the activity all over the cortex at the same time. We also developed clinical applications and um, Dr. Nina Force, who is now now a chief neurologist at the uh, Central University Central Hospital was crucial in this development. So we developed mapping of, um, mapping of brain activity for operations that is determining which parts of the brain should not be removed. And also we have later on studied how, how recovery of stroke from stroke is reflected in MEG. And it's important maybe to remind ourselves of some of the characteristics of a clinical application. It should be of course sensitive to the disease and specific to a disease. It should apply at an individual level, not only at a group level. It should be easy to use and the results should be easy to interpret. And it is especially it should be useful in patient care. And this is often over overlooked by us more technically oriented people, it must be accepted by the clinicians. And it should have a good cost-benefit ratio. Here is a recent example which might develop into a clinical application and this deals with autism. So autism is a, a disease in which the brain connectivity is, at least the brain connectivity is abnormal. And it has been previously shown that the long range connectivity is abnormal, but it, uh, it was unclear whether also the local brain connectivity was abnormal in, uh, in autism. And we we'll seek to answer the question, can we find with MEC connectivity differences between normal and autistic subjects? And our experiment was rather simple. We compared responses to houses versus faces. So faces mean responses which relate to other people which the autistic individuals have difficulty dealing with. And we found that there's no significant difference actually in the brain activity itself in the area which responds to faces, the fusiform face area. So surprisingly these groups were very similar in that respect. 
But when we looked how the activity is correlated between the fusiform face area and other areas of the brain, you can see there were differences. So when you connect from here to these three areas in the brain, there's stronger connectivity when you see faces than houses when you deal with normals, typically developing subjects. But when you deal with autistic subjects, the situation is re reverse or almost zero difference. So they don't care about the faces and very specifically don't care. Connectivity to different areas is, is impaired. And also within an area, there is a connectivity, de connectivity deficit. And this is reflected in so-called phase amplitude coupling. This means that one brain oscillation modulates the another oscillation. So, so that if an oscillation goes up and down, you go, when it goes up, you hear prr, prr, prr. So, and this higher frequency oscillation here is called the gamma rhythm and the lower frequency is the alpha rhythm at these frequencies. And it turns out that this locking between the frequencies is stronger for faces than houses in the face area for normals, but there's no such difference in the autistic. And this is rather surprising that this kind of a specific deficit can uh, uh, occur. And we didn't certainly know this from beforehand. And what we particularly didn't know was there is, a, is shown in this five-dimensional plot. So here on the three axes are the coherences from the face area to three different parts of the brain. And the color of these circles <coughs> indicates the probability of autism diagnosis based on behavior. So that red means autistic and blue means not autistic. And, and the size of the circle means how big uh, modulation of this local coupling there is between houses and faces. And you can see clearly that the blue circles are further away from the origin than the red circles and the blue circles are bigger. This means that these four measures that I mentioned, they directly correlate to the behavioral, the behavioral measures of the disease. So it may be that this is in the future clinically relevant, but still I would say that the clinical application is in the horizon. When I tell my doctor about some of our recent inventions, he often says, mm, but I don't think it's ready for prime time yet. <laughs> and that's <laughs> so meaning that he doesn't trust it. You, the medical doctors need to trust these, these measures before they can, can use them. So in the future, certainly there are developments in MEC. And right now it's very exciting that we are building, for example, this baby MEC device, which was a very small place for the head so that the sensors are close to the baby's head and we can study development early on. And here and elsewhere, new sensors are developed which are able to operate without liquid helium and therefore you can put them right on the scalp and then you get a good, reasonably good improvement of the uh, spatial resolution in MEG. And you can even think that instead of electrodes, you put something which is ma called magnetrodes on the head. So little thing is which touch the head and then you can measure the magnetic field. Here, Rita Hari and others have developed methods by which you can measure two persons at the same time in MRI to study functional MRI or to link two MEG systems which are five kilometers apart so that you can do for, for example, movements together and interact and see how the brain activity is related. And a final example of new developments is that we, are, we start having computational models which start from the microscopic level and they predict how the MEG signals would look. And since the models are at the microscopic level, they can be tested in animal experiments in rats so that we can get some mechanistic explanations of our MEG results. And this uh, I am working on with Stephanie Jones and Chris Moore from Brown University and my previous postdoc, uh, Alexander Cramford, who is now in Paris Telecom. So, science, innovation and clinical. I hope I have convinced you that in 
interactions are necessary for success. And I somehow hate this word consortium because it means something clerical. I think collaboration should emerge from needs rather than be dictated by somebody else. And, um, um, and I think better your vision can be realized or not is partly caused by, caused by a happy accident, uh, serendipity. And also we don't probably fully realize how demanding a word clinical application is. Let me end with a kind of a simple simple strategy for, uh, for success in science. Uh, this I call the Forte Fortissimo strategy, FFF. And um, first of all, don't be afraid to try something new. Remember that uh, professionals constructed the Titanic, but, um, but amateurs constructed the Ark. And you can, you remember which one of these was successful. Then uh, when you have this idea, this idea of a new thing, focus it and you can try maybe some pilot experiments and, and then you write what I call a winning proposal. This Finnish word apuraha anomus is a very terrible word. It sounds like you are applying for social security. You should, <laughs> you should yourself at least, this is the minimal requirement, you should at yourself at least be of the opinion that this is a winning proposal. And when you get the funding, you, you can then, you really get the freedom to do what you wanted to do, that is to realize your dream. And then you publish and go back to step one. <laughs> so, and I would like to end with my good friends and colleagues, late Jack Pelivos question, which he often asked, which is a very rele relevant question. Are we still having fun? I think we should have fun, fun doing science and teaching in the university. Otherwise, otherwise we don't function well. So, thank you. <laughs>